Okay, right. So there, there's a title. We got us that. If I could spell messenger, it'd be good, wouldn't it? I, I did this about midnight uh, last night, so there we go. Jimmy the One. And underneath the motto of the Royal Signal, Serta Cita, Cito, which I'm sure you all know means swift and sure. So get the message there fast and make sure it's correct. And that's yours too in the shack there. You don't really want to see that. A few Morse keys. Don't want to see that. That's where we are in Blandford, about 15 miles north of where I live in Bournemouth. Put it all there. There's the museum itself. Um, and we try and emphasize it's not just about the, the raw sig core of signals, it's the history of technology, of communications. And we are trying to appeal to the younger generation as well, which we'll come on to in a few minutes. Blanford is actually um, going back in Napoleonic times, up on the top of the hill there where the uh, garrison radio station is now, was a part of the chain from Plymouth to London. Um, and it was, as you could see in front of the, there, the screens, so there would be mess uh, message books. And it, it was rumoured you could get a message from Plymouth to London in 15 minutes. So it's a bit like FT8, really. <laughs> <laughs> Um, right, so we go on to in quick sort of quick tour of the museum. Cable layer, um, World War One mule driven, absolutely the only one left in existence in the world. And there is a very shady looking black and white um film that runs in there and showing these guys pulling the stream out, uh, pulling the wire out behind them uh, from the cart. Then the guy had no gloves on, he was just pulling wire out. Must have had hands like uh, leather, and then the guy uh, behind him on a horse with those two black, those black and white poles with a hook on the end, picking the wire up and slinging it into the hedge. So it's very, very crude but uh, effective. I mean, the other thing we should point out: the Royal Corps signals didn't come in, into existence until August 1920. But before that, it was Royal Engineers Signal Troop. So um, after the First World War, it became um, the Royal, the Corps of Signals, and then was got granted a Royal Warrant in two, August 2020. There's another museum. That's it. I'm just giving a quick overview of the museum. Um, it, it's sort of uh, some horse just stood there and a control vehicle in the background. And don't forget, I mean, the signals would use all sorts of methods to get signals through. There's a World War I dis dispatch rider uh, motorcycle. Um, quite a vintage machine that they will be uh, hurtling backwards and forwards on the messages. And then we come on to the 1930s, a radio car. I mean, um, that was the height of technology in the 1930s. And uh, there they were sat in it, uh, not, not very too happy um, ah. with a unknown radio sat inside it. So there's a little bit of into war years there. I mean, it starts off with the First World War, telephones, trench telephones, Boer War, underground, um, the cables, the first um, battle or war that was fought using telegraph and cables, in fact, was the Crimean War. It wasn't too popular with the generals as the um, war office could be in touch and issue instructions every day rather than leave the general in the field to carry on. So um, the Boer War, again, was used heliographs and um, cables were being laid and then uh, wound up just, some of them were just laid on the floor. The insulation, the, the uh, ground was dry enough not to sort of leak the signals away. So they would sort of reel out cable, then move somewhere else, then reel out a bit more cable. So it's all very crude. This is all on, on Morse. On the Second World War, we've got uh, quite a few uh, items there. That's the suitcase radio B2, weighs 15 kilos. And we uh, that's an original, uh, which I'm unfortunately not allowed to touch because I like to get it working. Um, but we have a suitcase full of 15 kilos worth of sand to demonstrate just how much it, would, it weighed and get the youngsters, to, when they come in, say, well, you know, you were a sort of a 22-year-old young lady getting off the train in Paris, German sentries everywhere, and you're walking down the um, station trying not to draw attention to yourself, and this thing was weighing 15 kilos, and all 
really all that's had should have in there is perhaps your clothes. So we make a quite a large play on that. Obviously, we've got an Enigma machine in there. And that's a very sobering thought. The life expectancy of an SOE operator was six weeks. Uh, average. Captured agents faced interrogation, torture and execution. Um, some very famous ones, Violet, Violetta Zasbo, um, was captured and died within a, about two months of the end of the war in, in uh, Ravensbrook. So when we're talking to schools, um, we've just done a, had a D-Day visit from a local school, 90 children, age 11, and they just started doing uh, World War II very, just in about 10 days. So it wasn't great detail. But we, we make the point that not only um, will these people be sent abroad to send messages back, we give them a quick demonstration of the radio, how you have to um, throw a bit of wire up, tune it in, um, your messages in code, you've got to send the code as fast as you can. We give them a, a demonstration of DF techniques. I've got a little five meg, well, about 4.7 meg transmitter clicking away in the corner and uh, a receiver with a loop aerial and show them the uh, what the DF is like and how it wasn't easy, but it could be done that you could direction find and, and pick up people. Um, and then at the same time, when we get onto Enigma, they've all heard of Enigma. Um, we talk about the role of amateur radio people. Um, G3VA was a famous one, uh, Pat Hawker, that were actually intercepting uh, the messages all over the UK. And I said, it's OK. You know, you've heard about Bletchley Park, but you, there was an army of um, amateurs and other interested people throughout the UK listing on particular frequencies, sending their logs in to Station X. And without those, Enigma would have been cracked. Um, and we sort of make the point that it's five letter groups. If you're listening to plain language, you can guess guess a missing letter. If you're listening to five letter groups, if you miss miss here or miss a letter completely, you can't replace it. So they would take sort of an average of the logs that came in from all over the country and decide which was the the, the correct um, uh, message that was received. And we're pointing out some of these people. Um, I think uh, Pat Hawker, G3VA, was 16 at the time. So his parents had to sign the Official Secrets Act on his behalf. And he only had a homemade TRF receiver. So the, um, they loaned him a, um, a Hamelin Sky Raider, uh, which is uh, pretty state of the art at the time. So there's quite a big section on World War II. Um, there's a bit of Morse running in the background all the time in the museum. Um, pictures of sort of secret agents, etc., and some of the equipment they used, and also some of the radios that were made by ex uh, Royal Signals that people had been captured in, in prisoner of war camps, and they'd actually sort of manufactured. Um, shortwave receivers so they could listen to the uh, uh, shortwave broadcast in the UK and then the, uh, once the invasion was underway when the troops uh, were in France to keep up to date what was going on. So we've got quite a few of those things in the, in the museum to look at. And there's a 19 set. Now that's what the first set I ever owned, um, about 1962, 63, and um, removed the 238 meg section and the audio amp and modified it to two to eight meg. And um, I remember all the solder joints trying to remove. They were wrapped four or five times around, around a, a tag and then soldered and then painted with red paint to say it had been inspected and tested. Um, but it was it would it worked and I think it cost me uh, one pound fifteen shillings um, from a well known radio London uh, dealer in London and fifteen shillings to get it transported down to Bournemouth. Again, World War II, 68 set, which is a high power version of the 18 set. Um, uh, we've got those that the kids can actually pick if people, well, not just kids, but any mu visitors to the museum can pick up and, and work, work out the weight of the thing. I mean, you're only talking about three or four watts of power, um, you know, anywhere between um, four and about eight meg. Uh, so they can actually physically see it and, and pick it up. And we also make a great point at this stage about the um, 
the way that radio operators were tortured and captured for their codes and how they were had uh, built in mistakes. So when they were left the UK, if they were sending uh, Morse or messages back under duress, they would make a deliberate mistake. Um, it might be um, the seventh and sixteenth letter of their um, signing on poem. Uh, they would all be originally issued with a poem, and they would use um, they would use perhaps the seventh, eighth, and nineteenth letters. Uh, they'd pick five letters out of it, and then they would send the codes what letters they picked. So, um, and that's what the Germans would know, want to know. But the, the downfall here was the poems they used were well-known ones, Charge the Light Brigade, Jerusalem, uh, things like this. So um, later on, when they realised that these were compromised, because the Germans could read English poems and think, oh, if they guess one word, they could guess the poem, and then the whole code was broken. So uh, Leonard, Leonard Marx... Um, took over, he's only young, 21, been turned down by Bletchley Park because he was too individualistic and created, they wrote their own poems. Some of them were quite rude, um, but they were unique to that particular operator. But when these messages came back to the UK, uh, sometimes it, obviously you're in the field, an operator was under duress, so sometimes they made mistakes. Um, and they uh, later on in the war, they actually recorded the operator's fists so they could actually decide whether it was that person sending or not. Uh, and the same with their codes. If they made mistakes in the coding when they were being trained, they could trace back, say, yes, it's the same type of mistake. But uh, an agent got dropped into Holland and was captured and turned, um, made to send messages back to the UK. This is 1943. And um, he did, included his deliberate mistakes. And the Dutch section of SOE said, well, that's OK, he's under duress, just, just ignore it. So he sent a few more messages, making the same mistakes again, as he should do, to say that he was under uh, duress, and they ignored it. So for a year, every um, SOE operative that was sent to Holland was captured within minutes of landing or followed to, to a safe house and the Germans were sending messages back and they were asking for uh, weapons, they were asking for uh, gold uh, sovereigns to pay people to bribe people, asking for chocolate and cigarettes, bicycle tyres and they kept it go going for a year and it was nicknamed the England Spiel, England game and in the end they couldn't believe that the, the the British were paying them at the same game. So they sent a message in clear saying, thank you very much for your all your generosity. All your gifts have been uh, received with, with many thanks. If you'd like to pop over and see us, we'll assure you of a warm welcome. Um, and because of this, in 1944, when the a bridge too far, Nijmegen, Arnhem, etc., the Dutch resistance warned the Allies that there were German panzers in the uh, woods around Arnhem and the British Army, um, because of this situation, ignored this and which led, played a significant part in the downfall of uh, the failure to take the bridge at Arnhem. But we, we try and make it sort of other than just history book, especially when we're talking to youngsters or groups of um, people that are interested in trying to just get away from the sort of dry history, historical facts where possible. There's Phil Marshall Montgomery's one of his command vehicles um, there in it, all its glory. There's no picture of him inside it, but that's in the middle there, the Second World War section. And that's just after the war. You've got a, a little uh, UHF uh, dishes there. I think it runs about um, uh, five watts. Um, so it's actually getting a little bit more modern after the war. And there we are. <laughs> the, ship, the ship spell. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Ken, I don't know you know the story. Ken email, had a long email from Ken, which I ignored for a couple of days until I went to the museum. And he said this is one of his jobs. And he's been addicted to rum and hammocks ever since his work was on the ship for 18 months. 
And so the ship Bell was, it was a command ship, I believe, wasn't it, Ken? Um, fitted out after the war. Uh, was it 1949 you went uh, there, Ken? Yeah, it was um, from 1949. I joined in 51. Yeah. I joined in 49. Um, yeah. 75 years ago. But, yeah. uh, but it was a river craft frigate. Uh, that's just why it's called the Meum, because the river. And there were four of these uh, converted. They took the, the four-inch guns off the front and uh, ended up with just three oil guns uh, to give space for bigger radio rooms. And they were originally fitted with uh, CR-100s, B-28s. And they then decided that, uh, having got them all bolted nicely in, but they changed them all for Murphy B-40s and the CR-100 B-28 19-inch wide and the, uh, the B-40s 12 inches wide. So nothing fitted, nothing fitted at the back. Everything was in proper Navy fashion. 18 bolts to each one with six coats of paint. So yes. the foreman of signal said, go down there and uh, change all those over. And uh, it'll take you a day, <laughs> day or two. Well, it took a bit longer than that, but there we go. Um, there's one other thing, Jeff. Um, if you got the bell, uh, at the same time, uh, the carpenter uh, down there made uh, one of these, I don't know what they call them, uh, Bob, Bob might know, down at the bottom of the gangplank, you traditionally have a stand with a... Uh, a life belt in, uh, and in the life belt you have the emblems of whatever you're doing. Yeah. And uh, the carpenter did a wonderful, wonderful job of carving the uh, the the combined operations emblems, uh, and and that would that would be great if you've got that one down there as well. But well, no. okay, I'll have a look because I I had a word with the. Uh the gaffer up at the um, museum, not the curator, because he's not of this world, um, but the guy that does all the work. And this was in uh, zone number five, tucked away in the corner. And going, oh, yeah, I think I've seen it. So I found it this week. So when I'm up there again next week, I'll uh, have a little look around, see what I can find. But this is like, um, there's a lot of stuff on display, but there's probably about three times as much in stores. And we just pull it out for different exhibitions and things. So now I've located this, I'll, shuffle it to the to forward somehow but i did try to pick it up bring it with me to put it behind me but you know well, as an elderly g3 it's probably you know I, I look after my hernia myself i think anyway <laughs> there we go yeah, but, uh, right it's 75 years since i saw yeah. that well there we go it's worth waiting for i like to i like to make it relevant to you anyway just going on to the museum obviously post-war um, we've got uh, a little snow tr snow cat there used by the Marines. Um, the ferrite, ferret, ferrite, ferret armored cars in UN colors used in Cyprus. When you see how small it is and, and how little protection it is, I'm not sure I'd like to ride around in it. Obviously, got the motorbikes there, and one of the um, the one of the museum attendants actually was one of the um, white helmets part of the last. White Helmets Displays Team, which was the dispatch riders and they used to do shows all over the country. And he's got all the metal in his legs to prove it where he came off the bike so many times. And that may look familiar to you. That's a loyalist voice of Ulster. Um, pirate radio in, in the Troubles. And if you look at it carefully, I would suggest it's come out of the RSGB handbook for a top band transmitter. Um, <laughs> Well, it, that's what it looks like. It's um, uh, 6L6 in there. In the museum as well, we, we try and make it relevant to youngsters so they get they can hands on, they can talk to each other on telephones. It's not just looking at things in display cases and going on. So we have, that's all interactive, sending relay, relay stations. We've got a little scope to hide some microphones so you can talk into it. In the right at the back there, there's, um, there's a simulator and you can drive a Jeep picking up signal flags at different points and trying to get there before you run out of petrol. And it's really trying to get the youngsters' hands on so it's not just, as I say, looking at things in glass cabinets. 
there's a guy there. He's got to try and set up a relay from one to the other, one end to the other, by moving sort of mirrors and around and, and reflecting lights there. And then you can obviously dress up. And that's the most important place to have a cup of tea. And they do a wicked cooked breakfast up there. If you ever visit the museum, it's upstairs, the communication cafe. And um, the other day there was there were three generals in there because the uh, uh, commanding officer of uh, the um, Royal Signals at Blanford is a lady. And the um, master of signals is a female who's just been promoted to the uh, defence staff. So um, there's quite an emphasis these days on um, female recruits and it's getting increasingly popular. I should point out that the Royal Signal Museum is in the middle of a working army camp. So if you do turn up, you must have photo ID to get in. Thanks. And on the gate, you park Thanks. outside, wander across to the gate, and there's a nice happy Gurkha chap who's in the defence um, force these days who will direct you to the pass office where you get a pass for you and your vehicle and then take a digital photograph, which doesn't look anything like you. And that's your pass for the day. Um, so um, at the moment, it's, it's a reasonably relaxed, but obviously the um, if it goes up, this threat level goes up, then these guys on the gate have got um, are, are armed. But it, um, it discourages a, a, a casual visit. You have to have photo ID. But having said that, there's also it's a it's a training establishment. So there's active signal regiments on the air, on the site, uh, which some are in cyber warfare, of the others in communications, and it's an all, all arms training. So you see a variety of guys walking around different berries. Um, you can, I was up there this week, and there were some youngsters just just joined because they were in sort of walk. Well, they weren't walking around in sixes; they were marching around in sixes on the pavement. And the old older ones were just um, just walking smartly, but not actually in, uh, in step. So it's, it is a, a working campsite, and a lot of the headquarters staff use this uh, uh, cafe, communication cafe. A bit of a plug here, 100 years of Royal Chorus Signals, um, produced by the Royal Chorus, uh, by the curator and uh, the deputy, and it's a, a book full of anecdotes rather than complete history from A, a to Z. So this is a First World War guy in, with a modern helmet on. Uh, originally for sale for £30, the Royal Signals Association uh, ordered so many thousand, I think 10,000 I was mentioned at one stage, and they still have a pallet and a half left. So they are now coming out at five pound or to members of your association. Um, we can say six pound, including postage to you, but you can talk to me afterwards about that. But it's very good. And in fact, there's a colleague of mine, G3YUE, who I actually taught RAE and Morse back in the 60s. On the left there with this moustache, He's in Whiskey Troop, Northern Ireland. Didn't realise he's in the book until I sent him a copy. And there he is today, sat in our uh, trailer uh, on the presentation day. GB1, now on now really to GB100 RSM, which, are, which is our permanent special event call sign. We actually activated this in uh, 2018 when we visited the school on the left there, which my granddaughter attended, it's Hillview Academy in Bournemouth. Um, years one to six, that's um, five to 11 year old. And we celebrated that and we had skeds arranged with Ypres and uh, Passchendaele. And as luck would have it, all the, uh, we, we ended up working every year, um, Mediterranean country you could think of, but we couldn't even hear Belgium. They couldn't hear us, but it was so busy. We had to work through, we were there for two days and we worked through our lunch hours to get all the kids to have a go. We took the Morse, we took uh, semaphore, we took codes and ciphers, so we had the whole school through in the in the hall, and it was echoey. And G three Y U Z, another uh, Ian, uh, again I taught A R E to, um, was struggling to hear it. So this is where we get onto the trailer as a way to replacing that. So that, we've now got that call sign, we've kept it, um, and it's a permanent uh, call sign for the museum. And we use it. It's not on the air all the time, but we use it 
Uh, we used it on D-Day when we had a school visit. We used it on the following Saturday. We had 80 guides um, from Dorset that came in uh, for the D-Day celebrations. They were actually on air. It's nice on Morse code because this this happened um, when, just after um, COVID. Or, uh, and it, I used it from my shack here and mainly mainly on CW, and I got quite used to sending that. I, I did think I should have got chosen a, an easier call sign, but it got used to it in the end. So that's our modern. Um, well, that was 100 years of the call, so that's 2020. Um, so that QSL went out, cards with quite a few people. Just a, f a selection of just a flavour of some of the post-war stuff. This was called the fish fryer for obvious reasons because the... the thing came up on the side there as if it was at all this was a uh, radios and it would have um cables coming in so landlines into radio or radio to radio so it would just be uh equipment there on the back of a land rover there and off they go and set up uh, so telephone lines would come in and use a radio link to the rear so now we come on to our trailer again this after this uh school um visit and the, the echoing noises in the hall and not only was the kids all getting excited but it was you know what school halls are like they echo and as they in had a poor show time that so we uh, talked to the radio communication foundation the rsgb legacy committee and they funded this trailer it's only a small one just single wheel um and we were backed by local companies there yezu Alphatronics, which is an Amer a company in Paul that makes power supplies. I used to supply them with all their WAM products and design it for them. Um, MLS there um, donated a couple of items. Yezu were very, very good. I'll show you what they sent in a minute. So we set this up. I, I live next door to my mother-in-law, which is lucky for me, but she's got a drive which is empty. So we fitted out the trailer with this. Um, ready to roll. A telescopic mast in the front. Um, so just a fiberglass one, about eight, nine meters. This is what Yezo, Yezo donated to us. Um, we popped up to see them. They're only their distribution is at Winchester. And they were very, they didn't say, I just sort of phoned up and said, I, could you help? We dropped them a line, did the same with Kenwood, did with the same icon. And Yezo said, yes. What would you like? So we've got that and that and marine bands for the coast. Oh, just hang on. Come back. What you done, Jess? Everybody else alive? All Suddenly the red, red arrows would be disappearing in the wrong direction. So it's receive only, I'm glad to say. And then... We were um, finding a couple of places we went to. We, we couldn't get a mains there. So uh, it was on the Bournemouth seafront on the Bournemouth Air Show. And we had a petrol generator. And, and uh, my youngest son, who was the health and safety manager at the time for uh, BCP Council, said we've had uh, a couple of fires on the uh, cliffs in previous years from petrol generators, diesel or nothing, or LPG. So again, we approached the RCF, Radio Communication Foundation, and they funded this uh, LPG uh, powered on the generator. So it's nice and clean, LPG rather than diesel. And that's useful. It's very low electrical noise, gives you 240 volts and 12 volts if you want to charge batteries. So that's available as well. So we've made, we finished this trailer, we have used it. Um, and it's on, it's available to borrow for um, any radio society. Recently, you may have seen this month's RADCOM, but the uh, Paul Radio Society borrowed it for the RNLI uh, um, anniversary celebrations on Paul Key. And there's a little bit about our trailer there. So it's been used. It's been used for um, Blackmore Vale Amateur Radio Society uh, for Chapel. Uh, chapel um, railways on the air and the army youth team at the uh, uh, tank museum the royal armored corps they used it to sort of train up some youngsters in, in the winter so it's it's being used it's i know it's a, a few miles from you but if you ever wanted to use that 
you can just come and collect it and use it as long as and uh, as long as you look after it and bring it back. That's all we ask. So is there? It's an instant way of just the idea is just drive up, drop the four four um, corner posts, plug in the mains or the generator. The units are in there. The aerials hung up. We've got a G five RV. Uh, 20, 20 and 40 meter dipoles, um, a diamond two meter and 77s vertical. So, or any arrows that you would like to use on it, it's all set up, ready to go. So it's a shack on two wheels. There's all the stuff we've got. The band tenor, I bought thinking it was easier to use, but we've never had much success with it. So we'll sort of give that up for the moment. Um, we've got semi-armored mains cable, so you can drive... Um, cars over it if you anywhere this is g3yue we spoke earlier he's in the chat there that was on the presentation when the we had the uh, after covid the formal presentation <coughs> excuse me um there's the rsgb president in the middle there uh, the guys this end um are yezu um guy next to him there in the sports jacket is alpha trikes managing director mnls up in the corner um the, the short chap, sort of with his hands together in front of me, there is the museum technical director, uh, which I work with. Um, there we are. I'm not actually talking to anybody because I don't use Cyber much. Another, another view there. So now we come on now to when we go out and about. Because the museum is in the middle of the camp, discourages. Um, I won't say discourages, but it's not quite so easy. It's just to, the tank museum is outside the camp grounds down at Bovington. So you just turn up as an ordinary person. This one's a bit more to get into. So we we go out. This is Chalk Valley History Festival, just outside Salisbury, sponsored by the Daily Mail on the farm belonging to um, uh, Mr. Holland, one of, Paul Holland, the one of the authors of many, many Second World War books. And it's they've got reenactors and all sorts of things. And this is our um, tent there. Outside, you can see we have um, we blindfold youngsters, give them a little VHF set, and somebody else talk them through the maze. It's, it's Morse code, etc. And the inside codes and ciphers, very very hands on. Um, it's not just looking at things. There's quick there, look inside. There's codes and ciphers being done on there. Nearest to us. Is the is some Second World War equipment? Someone's just going in the, in the maze there. Um, there's the Morse code section there on, on the left, and then we did Bournemouth Air Show on the beach, um, which um, we are the only. It was a very very hot day, but it lasted for five days. It's only three days this year. A very, very hot day, and all the military equipment around us was in dark green tents. They kept coming into our white tent just to cool down. But again, it was very, very popular. In fact, until the red arrows go over, it wasn't possible to go to the use the the loo facilities or, or take a drink. It was just, they, they reckon 750,000 people attended, and I think probably 90% of them went through our tent at one stage. So there we are inside. Similar outlook again. And then across on the there uh, was the the modern army youth engagement team. There's a officer there and uh, a couple of corporals and whatever. And they they were running virtual reality headsets and and the kids were in there. And you, so we could say, here's the history of the corps over the road. There is the modern corps. Go and have a look. I mean, we're not we don't recruit, but we just want to make young people aware that engineering um, communications are more than just picking up a mobile phone. Again, Chalk Valley, the radio maze outside. It, it, it's so popular. Uh, a lot of famous authors come down and, and guest speakers come down. It runs, as I say, from Monday to Sunday. The first three days are schools only. And a lot of the ones, year 10 and 11, are taking GCSEs, come down to listen to um, talks by, um, I'll say, experts, but authors and lecturers. And then when they're released, they come hurting out looking for something to do. And with a bit of luck, they head for our tent. Again, it's inside there. You can see a DF set there on the right with the, the um, loop arrow little thing I made. Again, the air show inside. Rather, you can see how busy it gets. That's last year looking down um, 
So I, I bumped into a, one of my former customers who's got a beach up halfway up there, and I was su supplied with copious amounts of tea, etc. by climb over the fence there. But it's in the military village, which is halfway between the two piers, and uh, so it's very, very popular. Then we this was um, communication day, and here at the other end of the camp, up on the high hill, is G4RS, Coal Block, Royal Signals Amateur Radio Society, Bamford Garrison. So these were some um, guys that we had for the day. So we had a museum tour, and then I took them up there and uh, went on, then they went on the air using GB100 RSM, but uh, it was, they got much better and bigger aerials, and uh, they had quite interesting contacts. These, now, we used that just out of the museum, but the army have declared three, uh, four classrooms adjacent to the museum redundant. So they now uh, belong to us. And when we have um, visitors of more than 10, uh, we set up the first room is codes and ciphers. His then the se second room is history of um, comms. This is the room I look after, which is the Morse code room. And then we also do, we've been donated some robots where so you can program robots. Then we do a trivial pursuit uh, in, uh, quiz in the museum. This was last summer. We had um, the Norfolk Army Cadet Force camping at Weymouth, which is about um, 25 miles away, and we hosted 50 cadets a day. Monday, they were very keen. Tuesday, they were reasonably keen. By Friday, they'd been camping for a week and doing all-night exercise. You had to try and turn the volume up on the Morse code to try and keep them awake, but they they enjoyed themselves. There were, there were some robots being programmed to follow different colour things on the floor. Yours truly. On the bench there, you can see there's some white boxes. Uh, I made it in the background, along on, on my right hand side, there's some old 19 inch rack equipment which the army did use um, to teach CW. And those great long leads went out to boxes across there. And they would just be people across the side there, side to side. The leads and everything were so long that we went to a Taunton school. We could pick up Radio Taunton better than the Morse code. So we designed these little boxes here and they're just daisy chain so you can just have two people or all, all the way through in operators talk to each other across the table and then i can override from the top and just send them uh, uh messages there and have a little bit of a competition that's one of the ones we i've done last year i did a library week through the school holidays um i got one on monday as well um children uh, to, to teach them more, to give them, uh, there's one chance to, which I'm doing again. And we've tried not to teach them Morse code. You, you only got them for three quarters an hour, an hour. So I concentrate on that. E-I-S-H, T-M-O. Easy to remember, one dot, two dot, three dots. You know this, everybody. So I've got a little repertoire of four or five letter words and not rude ones. And we have a little competition. So there's a few words I would use. Um, and uh, I would sort of send those and we've got small, some prizes. Um, little snow globe. The story being that um, the, the guy that used to run the shop, museum shop, what, ordered a thousand of these from Hong Kong. Uh, the guy in the middle doesn't really look like Jimmy. The one looks like a sort of... Um, well, I don't know really what it looks like. I think it's sort of um, an Android or something. And they were on sale for £10 and they sold three. And they finally got down to about fiver and they still got 950 left. So we now use them as prizes as well as these Royal Signals teddy bears. The other thing we do with the youngsters is simple codes. So we cut those out of cardboard, pin in the middle, so you can set, you can move it around five, so A becomes Z, et cetera. They can make that. They can take it home with that. If you can show the youngsters something they can make and and play with, leaves more impression than just talking about Morse code. And that's another library. That's uh, Oakdale Library in Paul. Very well attended. That's a little unit I made to show. is in a, a Yorkshire tea thing, just about a little three-watt transmitter just to show what we can we do done and a red board paraset that's a, a polish army 
uh, unit, which was made in uh, North London for the Polish um, SOE. There's a, there's the Morse classroom again. You can see all the units there. So you can go up to, we you know, end up with 10 pairs of youngsters there. And just, um, and there's the control box at the top there. We did, uh, with one school, we did together with um, Wolford Electronics. He produced this little medium wave and top band radio set kit, which we uh, went around with schools and um, local scale group. Again, Alpha Trikes, my former customer, uh, paid for the peninsula group wars to be made professionally. Um, and the RCF funded uh, some money towards it. Again, the kids walked away with a working radio listen to radio um not much on top band but we did make a small top band transmitter that we could send more songs they could listen to it or mcw on and that's one kanga products um they make a little morse code um unit um because we've always wanted to sell a morse code kit in this in the museum shop um so if he's this is one of his designs and he's put our logo on it comes as a kit or we actually i made the few up so that's it's selling quite well um coal block g4rs open to anybody not necessarily you had to be x signals as long as you had some connection to the military um cadet force work for the military anywhere along the line welcome this is the G4S uh, station manager, Martin, 2E0MVE, sorry, HVE. And he's got this uh, ex-army wagon with a nice uh, pump-up mast on top. He attends rallies, etc. cetera. Uh, a little icon there in the middle. But this is a sort of Cold War unit from uh, Germany that would sort of intercept um, radios, radar, et cetera, et cetera from the Eastern Bloc and analyze the signals. That's G4RS, we talked about earlier at the top of the camp. You can just see an 80 meter dipole there. The mast, et cetera, have just undergone their uh, annual inspection. There's also the uh, GB3DT um, runs from there, the repeater. And it's quite active. And the Colonel that's just taken over, Lady Colonel that's taken over of the um, uh, camp, had a scheduled visit like you do half an hour and two hours later she's still there and very keen um, for the something other than going to the local flesh pots for the younger soldiers to do. So she's really encouraged that this is running and trying to recruit more young, young soldiers, male and female in there and give them the appreciation of something other than military radio. So, there's some contact details. Um, Ken, I'd like you to tell you, to send your story to Storyteller at Royal Signal Museum if he hasn't contacted you. His job, Ryan, is to collect stories, anecdotes, personal stories of X core so it's not lost to the next generation. It's all right looking at medals, but we need to know um, the, the trustees of the Royal Signal Museum don't want to capture people's um, memories, thoughts, not necessary military th things. They might have played in the hockey team. They might have um, got drunk in, in Holland and, and wish they hadn't or whatever. Um, so if you have a moment, I'd love you to send it. I've sent the email to uh, Ryan that you sent me about the details. So I hope he will actually... Um, get in contact with you or you can get in contact with him if you need to book the trailer there's my information there you can get me through the museum anyway so really that's the end no one said anything i can't hear anybody snoring so hopefully hopefully it has been of some interest to you yes yeah. very interesting indeed I haven't been. I have been there, but I don't remember half of what was there. So, good few well, years ago. Yeah, it does change. We've oh, just we obviously did a Fol a Falklands uh, exhibition. We have a one room which was um just used as a sort of dumping room. Um, they've got in there now. They've got a um uh, of 
when Yugoslavia splintered Serbia, etc. Yeah. They've got an exhibition there. Um, they've even got a little miniature uh, range where you can uh, fire a uh, nine millimeter automatic at targets electronically. It does actually have a bit of a recoil on it. You can That's try that for it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and because it's it was like, a uh, carriage in Richmond, it yeah. was um, in uh, uh, oh, well, it got blown up by a landmine, and it was on NATO. NATO yeah. Um, can't think. Damn, don't mind. It can't speak that one. Yeah. Okay. The other thing I'll say is, as a club, if you wanted to organise a visit to the museum then obviously we can take you not just the museum, but behind the scenes. We can go up to G4RS and run the club station, run the uh, special course line from there. We can show you, we can do, we can tailor the, the classrooms to uh, whatever you like to do. If you want to do a more session, fine. If you want to do to comms, um, things like that. So we're very, very keen on bringing groups of people in uh, we uh, uh, I look up. We've had the University of Third Age visit. Um, I've done school visits. I've done um, visits where I talk about the same as I've done here, but take things that they can play with and send Morse code and pick up and look at. I take a clansman in and pick pick up for the kids and put it on their back and watch them really fall backwards um, and things like that, so they can actually get involved. I've done it for the, some of the Townswomen Guilds, the NHS pensioners, civil service pensioners. I've got a local museum, Red House Museum in Christchurch coming up. Charmister Hospital, um, Charmister Library on Monday. Um, and uh, we are interested in sort of making ourselves aware, but also bringing people into the museum. I look at the museum, but we can do tours we can talk about as much as you like or as little as you like. We can take you to see some of the stuff behind the scenes, like the bell, which was sort of tucked away, which I didn't know was there, but I had to go looking for. So as a club, if you want to organise something like that, um, if it's after hours, we, we we can have access. It doesn't matter. We can sort of accommodate it. Just a thought for future, if you're planning things for next year. Yeah, sometimes, Jeff, we'll bear that in mind for committee meetings. Yeah, we could jump in. Yeah. Yeah, we we could arrange the old chara bank in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, quite. Anyway, quite. there we go. Yeah. Okay. Well Thank you. Yeah. anybody got anything else I can add to this? Um yeah. anybody? Yes, Ken. Um, yeah, well, trailers. We have a trailer very similar to yours. It's about as much room inside as yours, um, but it's kitted out and it's very useful. And we take it out to outside events. And uh, the generator's always been a problem with having to get petrol and all the rest of it. So we've now gone to a, uh, a very special uh, battery, which is weighs less than the ones we used to have. And now let's just take the one one battery out instead of the general. Yeah. That's that's very useful. But um, I, I I had to laugh in some of the dialogue how you teach them Morse code, EIS, yeah. TMO, nothing yeah. same is that it? And, uh, well, the, the, yeah. Well, the problem we we have, I mean, is we we haven't got time to teach them the Morse code. And you know what youngsters are? They've got to be. You've got to grab their attention. <laughs> Bit like a G three, bit like G threes. You if you know you have got to grab their attention straight away, uh, or else they wander off. So we thought, well, we just stick to those. It's easy for them to to learn in that short time, and they can have some element of competition. And you want to see some of them. You know, you spread it out, and you can see them scratching their head. Some of them, and I've got to admit, the girls are far better than the boys at this. They're sitting there and they're thinking. I say, what's that word then? They've got E T H O S, and they're going. Uh, et, etos. No, no, no. Look at it again. Ethos. Oh, yeah. And Moss. And they go M O S S uh, Mose. I said, no, look at it again. And they're so taken up with the um, 
getting it right. They don't sort of stop and think what it is afterwards. But it's surprising. Um, some of them, the ones on the D-Day there, we had some of these um, the guys come back in afterwards and they were sort of said, can we send you our lunch here, Harry, in here? Yeah. Um, and they were sent, they were picking up very fast. And we had a Stonehenge school come down and they were, it was their computer people. They were, what, 15 and a half? Some of them were really, really keen. So we're trying to take this keenness and advertise amateur radio. Amateur it's, radio isn't it's people for people now. that are over 70. It's very difficult or, now, you know, yeah. the magic, the magic yeah. you could speak to Australia, uh, they've just got a mobile phone in their hand and they say, well, we can do that, you know. Mm. Um, and uh, there are a few of us still left that uh, don't think that FT8 is um, anything other than a play thing and don't want to know anything about it, although I am told. <laughs> Bar that, humbug. Of course, I'm pretty <laughs> old and I don't understand these things. But, uh, you you, you mean there's not you mean there's not AM anymore? There's no. not top. There's not ten watts AM with the coastal radio stations. And that uh, and ten watts, ten watts when you've got your license on CW yeah. and had to provide your book to the post yeah. to get it vouched before yeah. they put you near a microphone. Yeah. Oh, well, my um, uh, my uh, first uh, inspection. My first radio inspection by the post office was by Mr. Spark, who came round to see me of an evening. And luckily, I was crystal controlled on top band at 80, so I didn't have to have a wave meter. But just to say that I do other things, here's a donation to the museum and HRO, which is working. And behind me, you can see a 342 yeah. and a collection of uh, Morse keys. The one I use on there is a Junkers. Uh, one I use all the time, but there's a few old ones up there. So um, I'm, res you know, I get banished to the bottom of the garden. Anyway, yeah. there we go. Tomorrow, Bob N four X eighteen, who is there uh, listening, uh, will be on the battleship New Jersey, um, as he is most weeks on CW um, to keep it all alive. Bob. Well. Yeah, yeah. Norm normally uh, on Saturday morning, I arrive at 9 a.m., which would be 1400 Zulu and set up. And I usually start out on 14052. But on weekends, generally there's a contest on. So uh, I'll, I'll shift maybe to 17 if it's open or, or sometimes 12 or 10. But usually usually I'll, on Saturdays, if, if 20 meters is busy, I'll have to shift to 17. And What's, your course? I, What's the call uh, sign on there? November Juliet 2, Bravo, Bravo. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, Jeff, uh, uh, just a few minutes ago, you mentioned when we started out, when it was crystal controlled and you yeah. had to search up and down the band. It wasn't as easy as it was today where the person <laughs> goes back on the same frequency. <laughs> well, I I was um, press ganged when I used to belong to, I was about, I think, 19. Um, used to drive a BSA Bantam. Um, and the local two-meter guys at VHF NFD went up on Wind Green, which is north of Shaftesbury. And we had a two-meter aerial. We had a Sherpa van. And the arrow was in the back there. Yeah, the back door's just slightly open to keep the wind out. And it was the Armstrong method rotation. And I was crystal controller one frequency. We had two receivers, and we used to finish the sign off saying tuning from both ends in. Yeah. And I've never forgotten <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's changed dramatically. Even tuning yeah. has changed. Where where I used to have to do these controls, now I just push a button. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Can't beat tuning, tuning in, can you? Yeah. Anyway, there we go. Well, um, I hope it's been some interest and it's not been mega boring. No, um, very good. Um, yeah, very good. Uh, yeah. It's just to try and give you a flavour and wear my amateur radio hat as well. I, I want to try and encourage the children, young people of all descriptions, into electronics, not necessarily amateur radio, but to most teachers, an engineer is the guy that fixes your car. He's not the yeah. guy that designs a piece of equipment or gets it working or whatever. Um, and, you know, if we can educate those as well, 
um, and at the same time to get him into the um, I was talking to a guy that runs the Army Cadet Force for Dorset and the ones that do the sort of stage four training, whatever they call it, they're now encouraging them to take up the um, novice license. So there's a whole group there of youngsters that are in the cadet force because they want to be, not because they have to be at school, and they they want to pr produce, um, get them as part of their training and qualifications in the army cadets to take a novice license. So there we are. There's there's a young people out there that we can actually grab hold of and say, yeah, amateur radio is relevant. FTA the satellites, everything. And Morse code is only used by old fogies, but, you know, so we're old fogies. Um, but, uh, you know, it. They the kids are fascinated by it because they can make noises, they can do things, and they can actually receive something and achieve something. they got iPads, they got phones, they can pick them up. But this is actually um, doing something and achieving it. The only problem we have is using army phones or um, radios is getting them to release the button when they finish talking. They have the concept of push to talk is completely mm -hmm. alien to them. Mm -hmm. Anyway, <laughs> right, <laughs> gentlemen, yeah. I should, and, and ladies, oh, hey, oh, ladies oh. I will bid you farewell unless anybody else has anything oh, super important to tell me. Yeah. So I can speak up because we're not getting not getting in glorious technicolor. <laughs> speak when you're showing that. Thank you. Ah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, you two gentlemen, mm -hmm. yeah. Robert and Ken, I, I'd love you to to get in contact with uh, storyteller at well, Rossi Museum and give a and tell me your history. I, I've got four sons, and um, to a man, they are totally and utterly, um, they don't want to know about wagers. Mm. Of course, their excuse is, well, we never had a dad. He was always in the shack, so we don't <laughs> want to be like that. <laughs> anyway, yeah. thanks, for, thanks for seeing you, and uh, yeah, I'm sure we've all enjoyed every moment of it. Right. Well, I hope you have. Yes. But, um, Thank you very much. Is, Thank okay. you. I, Okay. So See, I've, I've, re I've retired from the Navy after 30 years of service in 1984. So I've been doing retirement pay for longer than I was in. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Well, I I um I, I saw the my business seven years ago. They took on all my staff, uh, ten staff, all my customers, all my suppliers, bought my stock, and paid me over three years. So I was quite happy. Um, and then I sort of thought, well, what should I do? And I saw the, the museum thing. And then the granddaughter, recently, 23, started a pottery cafe in Blandford. And so two days a week, yours truly can make mocha, latte, you know, <laughs> fix, fix things, screw things to the wall, do the customer chat. My other half, Glow, Nanny, she's upstairs as the glazing and the pottery kiln. And then the granddaughter, after 18 months, said, I've just taken an option on a shop in Shaftesbury, which is another 15 miles north. So we've laid this. So we've laid the 60 amp cable in, ready for the new um, kiln, which is about an eight and a half kilowatt. Um, and um, I'm up there Sunday putting the CCTV in, um, building the rest of the racks. Um, and hmm, yeah, okay. And mother-in-law, who's 101 this year, lives next door, and she supervises me on cutting the grass. And doing the hedges, so <laughs> it's a busy retirement. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Cheers. And, thank you, okay, it's good. It's good night from him, and it's yeah. good night from him. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.